This is a series about the unexplained, about things that are seen and yet not seen, about events that our common sense tells us can't possibly occur, and yet they have occurred, burned into people's memories, never to be forgotten. Our stories come from all over the country, and they involve people who didn't have the slightest belief in the paranormal until it forced its way into their lives. In this series, we tell their stories when we grapple with the uncomfortable questions that arise. What is happening? What do these stories mean for our understanding of the way the world works? And what does science have to say about it all? There are far too many of these happenings for them simply to be brushed aside. They have now to be confronted. This is one of a maze of tunnels under the old treasurer's house in the ancient city of York. It runs down into the cellars. It also happens to lie right in the center of the old Roman fort that occupied this site 2,000 years ago. It was here that one chill February morning, Harry Martindale, plumber, was sent to run in a new set of water pipes. Uh, my job was to knock a hole through where this pipe is here, through the ceiling. I uh, came down, spent a whole day knocking the hole through the ceiling. I had no idea then it was several feet thick. And I came down here the second day, continued to knock the hole through the ceiling. I uh, had a short ladder in the centre of the floor here, and in the centre of the floor was the original Roman road and it being laid out in sections. You know, I knew whatever it was was old, but I had no interest in it. In fact, I put the base of the ladder on the Roman road. Just before lunchtime, I started to hear the sound of a musical note. There was no tune, just a blend of a note. And I thought, well, someone had a wireless on another part of the building. And the sound got louder and louder. And I realized at the same time, the sound was actually coming from the wall here. And when I realised this, I just glanced down in line with my waist on the right-hand side here, and I saw that a figure had come out of the wall. What I was looking at was the top of a helmet with the plumes on. Now, I knew whatever it was shouldn't have been here in the cellar with me. And through the shock and the terror of seeing this, I just stepped back off the ladder, landed on my backside, and then scrambled into the corner of the cellar there. When I looked at the figure, it was almost a complete figure of a Roman soldier. He came out of the wall, walked at a slight angle to the wall to the wall opposite, and as soon as he cleared the wall, then a horse came out of the wall behind him, where the Roman soldier sat astride. Now, once the horse had cleared the wall and was going through the wall opposite, then Roman soldiers came out in twos. Now, I was in no fit state to count them as if they were going into the ark, but there were at least 20 of these Roman souls appeared here. This extraordinary apparition took place in what must have been one of the busiest parts of the old Roman fort, on the main road from the northeast gate, running towards the main barracks. The treasurer's house, where Harry was in the cellar, lies on the edge of that road. We're standing now on Chapter House Street which is close to the line of the Roman Via Decumana. That is the main Roman road which led from the northeast gate of the fortress, away in that direction, to the headquarters building of the fortress, which is away to my left. And Yorkminster now stands on the site of the Roman building, and some 12 feet below the great um, medieval cathedral, you can still see remains of the Roman walls as they were excavated in the late 60s. Immediately to my left here is the cellar, and this is where the surface of the Roman road was found when the cellar floor was taken up. And this is where Harry saw the soldiers. Now, terror uh, is, is a difficult word. I think what I felt in here was worse than terror. And I can assure you, your hair does stand on and you can actually feel this. Because what I was looking at, although I only had one single light in here, what I was looking at were same as you and I. But the difference between them and me was they were coming out of a wall. The wall didn't exist as far as they were concerned. The only other Roman soldier I'd seen prior to this is what we call, or what I call, the Charlton Hessen, riding a beautiful horse, very smart. These were complete opposite. The first thing that struck me was how small they were. They were very small indeed. Another remarkable thing, that when they first came out of the wall, I couldn't see them from the knees down until they came to where the Roman road had been excavated, 
and I could see them from the sandals up. So much so that when the horse came through the wall, and when it was going across the, where the Roman road had been excavated, I could see that the fetlocks of the horse were real bushy. It is this kind of strange detail that lends credence to Harry's story. These ghostly soldiers were clearly walking on the old Roman road surface. So only where the cellar had been excavated back to that level could he see them at full length. Over the Roman period, the road has been remade and uh, resurfaced and the ground level has risen. So I presume that Harry has seen soldiers perhaps of the late first century, in other words, of the Ninth Legion who were here in York at that time. This man who knew nothing about Roman history or Roman military equipment was able to give a detailed description of the soldiers' appearance, right down to their weariness and the stubble on their chins. I wouldn't say that they were all that smart, although they all had the same uniform on. The helmet, the metal helmet, came right underneath the chin here, and from where I was sat with the single light I had on here, I could see there was growth of hair here on the face. They had the coloured plumes coming out the top of the helmet, and as we were going by, I could see they were going down the side of the, uh, the back of the head here. They all wore the same thing. On the top, over material, were strands of leather, all the way around. And the only thing I can say they had on under it was a skirt, like a green coloured skirt. All of them carried a short sword on the right hand side. This was the side nearest to me. And it was a short sword, like an oversized dagger. Harry's description, given very shortly after his experience, was examined in great detail by historians. It proved to be accurate in just about every detail. The armour that the legionaries wore was what was called lorica segmentata, which is thin strips of steel which were attached to a leather base. And um, they are a very distinctive feature of the uh, of legionary um, armour and um, would have provided, on the one hand, very good protection for the upper body, but at the same time flexibility. The Roman soldiers sacrificed their um, protection below the waist to mobility, all they had uh, below the waist was a sort of sporran like affair, which was a, th a series of strips of. His descriptions seem to be totally wrong. In his written testimony, he described the soldiers as carrying rounded bossed shields, quite unlike the traditional Roman rectangular shields. But in fact, this single detail only served to underline the veracity of Harry's experience. One was carrying a long, like a lance affair. And one of the soldiers that were walking out of the wall carried a shield. Now, in the centre of the shield, it was like a raised bulb. Now, Harry refers to round shields, and we don't normally associate these with legionaries. But the Roman army also included auxiliary troops, and these were soldiers who were recruited in frontier areas and from subject peoples and so forth, and their equipment was really rather different. And uh, we know, for example, that they did have rounded or oval shields. So it may well be that what Harry has seen is a detachment of auxiliary troops who were attached to the fortress in York for some particular function. We know, for example, that at Cawthorn, which is to the northeast of York, um, there are a number of um, fortifications there which include a couple of what we think of practice camps. So in order to keep their hand in, as it were, the soldiers were sent out to, uh, to train by building practice fortifications, rather in the way that soldiers are um, kept busy today. The, the last thing that the Roman um, authorities wanted was soldiers sitting around with time on their hands. The terror that I felt was because I could see them, exactly as I can see anyone else here now. So I thought, naturally, all they had to do was just glance to their right and see me there in the corner. And obviously, I think the terror was in case of doing any harm. But they didn't. They just looked ahead of them, going through the wall opposite. When the last one had cleared the cellar, gone through the wall, and I couldn't hear or see anything else, then I made my escape out of here. When Harry described his remarkable experience to the curator of the museum at York, it turns out that he was by no means alone in having seen the legionnaires. Mud bespattered, weary, returning perhaps from a training exercise, or a cross-country forced march. In a sense, it could be said that the Roman camp in York is still active. And that seems to be true of many other Roman sites around the country. The Roman legionnaires are still with us.
The Romans occupied this country for over 400 years. They had over 25,000 men stationed here, and they imprinted themselves very firmly on the British landscape. They brought with them their architecture and their technology. They built cities and forts and farms and villas here, linked by a network of arrow straight military roads to move their legions quickly to any trouble spot. They made wine here, reared families, grew up and died here. Thousands of Romans lie buried on British soil. For a long time, Colchester, out on the East Anglian marshes, was the Roman capital of the country. One of the roads leading out of the city ran east to West Mersey Island. The modern road follows the old Roman causeway. West Mersey Island was well developed. It had farms and villas and a Roman princess. Legend has it that she was married to a centurion from Colchester and that she is buried in a large burial mound quite close to the road. Some local people would claim that the Romans are still active on West Mersey Island. Jill Smeaton, for example, who lives very close to the burial mound, has heard them. Well, in 1987, um, I'd been living here, I suppose, then for about 10 years. And I'd always been a little bit frightened, perhaps, when I was going out to do the late night feeds because we keep horses here. Uh, but after nine, ten years of seeing and hearing absolutely nothing, I'd forgotten all about it, to be honest with you. And then suddenly it was the night of the autumn equinox, as I say, 1987, September the 23rd. Very, very black night. There was absolutely no moon whatsoever. The tide was over the strews, so we were actually cut off at that time. I think it was around three or four in the morning, and I'm a very, very heavy sleeper. I don't wake up for anything normally. And yet suddenly I just sat bolt upright in bed because going past my bedroom window, we live in a bungalow, um, was the sound, very, very clear, definite sound of two horses unshod walking along as though they were going through reeds or long grass, which was extraordinary because I'd cut the grass that very day. It had been long, but it was completely shorn. But it was a swishing, whooshing noise. And coming behind these two horses was the sound of very, very heavy wooden cartwheels just rumbling along, not going very fast as you might imagine a chariot but just rumbling along, whether it was perhaps a funeral procession, I don't know, it could even have been that, but it was such a heavy wagon or whatever that they were, or cart that they were dragging, that the walls of the bungalow were actually reverberating. It was really like being in the middle of a, a Western movie, just the, the noise of the horses and carts going past. And um, my friend in the room next door heard exactly the same thing. And uh, although she's a much lighter sleeper than I am, I mean, I'd normally sleep through anything, but we both rushed out into the hallway. And uh, funny enough, her husband didn't hear anything, nothing at all. And yet the two of us heard this tremendous rumbling noise going past, thought our horses were out, looked out of the window in a panic, thinking we were going to have to rush out and herd them up. But they were just going past too slowly for that. We couldn't see anything. And our own horses just few hundred yards away were completely silent. Um, so we then heard it move away. We looked through the windows, couldn't see a thing, but again, as I say, it was completely black. And it seemed to move across the road, away from the Strood, and go up in the region of Dawes Lane. Many other people have heard similar sounds of carts and chariots moving across the island. Others claim to have seen the centurion husband, perhaps on his way to visit his wife's tomb. One September night, my friend and I came back from Colchester. We've been to the local, well, one of the pubs in there and had a few drinks and saw some of our girlfriends and that. We came back onto Mersey Island over the Strood on the East Mersey Road. As we turned into Dawes Lane, about 400 yards up the road, where there was a pond and haystacks, misty night in the headlights. This figure came out between the pond and the haystacks, walking towards the mound. And uh, he looked Roman centurion. He had a helmet on with an eagle on the front. He had a shield, he had a sword. Uh, he had a uniform on and he thought he had a red skirt. Well, he couldn't see his legs. And um, we stopped the car, 
and uh, my friend said, you'll have him tonight. And uh, he jumped out of the car and I followed. And we went about oh, 400 yards down the road where there's a mound, a um, Roman mound, with an opening in it. And um, he sort of looked at us and then he disappeared. We were coming along Mersey Strood one evening at about 12 o'clock. It was high tide and the full moon. And as we were going along the Strood, I was happy to look across the opposite side of the road and there was somebody walking along and I looked and it was the Roman ghost. And I said to my husband, oh look, there's the Roman ghost. And my husband said, don't be so silly, what on earth are you talking about? We returned round and came back, and we came along slowly. And um, I wear my window down on my side because I was on the near side, and mm. had a look. And there was this Roman, and my husband saw him as well. And he was all dressed up and holding his um, two sp spears, and he was had all the leather sort of skirt on, and and he was sort of very upright and straight. And he was quite a large man, and he was just looking straight ahead. He was looking, oh, you know, his, his face was all rounded face, and his eyes was just looking st straight ahead. And um, we went further up, turned round. Then when we turned round, came back, he just completely disappeared. And the water was at high tide, it was level with the pavement. And there was no boats, no cars, not a bicycle, nothing. And he just completely gone. Sounds, of course, totally inexplicable. What can possibly be happening in these kinds of experience? How can Roman soldiers still be marching across the countryside nearly 2,000 years after the legions left these shores? What do the scientists have to say about it all? Well, that's the major question. When the Society for Psychical Research was set up over a century ago by a group of very distinguished academics from Cambridge University, the belief was that they would, uh, very quickly, by using scientific methods, they would find out exactly the reality or otherwise of phenomena of this kind. Well, a hundred years later, we're still searching, we're still looking. And the Society, over that century, has had many of the most brilliant scientists in the country as members. All that they've been able to do in the end is to be relatively convinced that these phenomena happen. But uh, we're very, very far from an explanation of them. It ends up, in the end, as a matter of belief. One extraordinary theory that has some currency argues that in some way buildings and rocks and the Earth itself absorb energy from living beings who inhabit them, and that later on, under certain conditions, that energy, that signal, can be replayed, rather like a CD or a tape. Indeed, it's called the stone tape theory. You have to postulate that in the case of a typical haunt, some very emotion-laden scene or some very important scene from the point of view of the humans who took part in it has somehow become registered on the environment, not necessarily within a house, maybe even outside, and that it looks, it's almost like a sort of psychic video that has been created. and. Someone who comes along who is sensitive enough to act as a psychic video player will actually play that tape and see the figures or perhaps even hear voices or hear sounds. And it is nothing, it is nothing to do with the people who originally were there. They're no longer there. It's simply a record. If you imagine some sort of environment whereby say, some individual undergoes some drastic effect, like decapitated or something like that, and the energy liberated at that particular point in time, in fact, is transmitted, expelled, into the surrounding material and stored in that material. These subtle energies, a series of vibrational frequencies, can, in fact, then be read out at some later time, very much like, a, say, a video recording. So a sequence of rather drastic events can in fact be recorded in living matter. At the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, one eminent physicist, Brian Josephson, expresses an even more outlandish possibility that inanimate matter 
could actually have consciousness. In its present state of knowledge, he argues, science couldn't deny such a proposition. Well, the idea that um, a piece of matter can hold impressions of the past is a very surprising observation. Um, it would be very hard to explain. And the only way I could understand it would be if the um, stone or whatever it was had some kind of consciousness and could remember on account, um, on, on that account. Um, now whether it could have consciousness or not, um, we don't know. Consciousness is assumed to be always connected with brains, but we don't really have any kind of theory of consciousness uh, in, in science which would tell us that it should be associated entirely with brains. And so if science were ever to have a proper explanation of consciousness or a proper theory of it, it's um, always possible that it might allow uh, a, a wider collection of objects than just brains to possess it. I, my hope is that science will be able to uh, demonstrate these things in a reliable way in the future and be able to provide a scientific explanation for them in the future which is in no sense, of course, saying that they would not therefore be spiritual or religious also in, in orientation, because the two things need not, need not be separate in that sense. But clearly science is still struggling for an explanation of things and events that it's not really equipped to explore. Meanwhile, there is no doubt in the validity of Harry Martindale's extraordinary experience. It is burned into his memory as vividly now as on the day he experienced it. One of the churches I belonged here in York, they uh, put pressure, pressure on me as a Christian. They didn't think it was right that I should mention my ghost story. And I went along with this for a while. But then I think, no, why? Why shouldn't I mention it? I'm not trying to convince you that what I saw in here happened. I know it happened to me. Whether you believe this or not, I just, just didn't bother me whatsoever. No one has ever turned around to me and says, you're a liar.